this is Ria. Welcome to Little Stories for Tiny People. I'm recording this story on the edge of spring. I'm looking out my studio right now. It's just beautiful out. Oh, that's, well, that's strange. There's this bird, this big bird that is, well, it's glaring at me. It's, it's more than a glare, really. It, it's like, it's like it wants to eat me. Oh, it's so creepy. It's not looking away. Uh, I feel like I can't look away. Okay, this, this is so silly. I'm in my studio. It's not like that bird could come in my window. That's not realistic. Okay, you know what? <laughs> Let's just get to the story. The sooner I'm done, the sooner I can uh, leave. It's called The Bird and the House. Take it away, Bowie. Remember, there are no pictures. You have to imagine the pictures in your mind. You can imagine them however you want. Okay, here we go. On a cool day in early spring, three people, one tall, two small, walked out the back end of a house. They'd done it before. After all, they lived in the house, and it only made sense that sometimes they'd walk out the back of it. But what seemed different that day, different than the other times they'd walked out the back door, was their clear sense of purpose. They were on a mission. Their footsteps were careful, controlled, They were the kind of footsteps that usually led them out the front end of the house. Backyard footsteps were not careful. They were fast and wild and paired with laughter. (laughs) They were stomps through the yard, splashes through mud, leaps onto the tire swing suspended from an old oak. But that day in early spring, Those people used front yard footsteps out the back. And it was those slower, measured, out-of-the-ordinary footsteps that caught Finch's attention. Finch was perched in a red maple tree in the yard. She landed on that branch on that red maple tree for a little while each day. From her perch, Finch had a nice view of the house. She could see well into the room at the back of the house, with its couches and the one big colorful pillow that seemed to travel the room, always in a different spot when Finch glanced over. There was a cat inside the room, behind glass. She knew it was glass because one day she'd watched in horror as a bird, mindlessly singing to itself la, as it la, flew. La, 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 Smacked right into it. La, la. There were a few terrible moments when the bird lay motionless on the ground. Finch held her breath. She could hear the cat meowing inside the house. The small people appeared, pointing their little fingers at the fallen bird, their eyes wide. Then, as if it were pricked by an invisible pin, the bird popped up from the ground. I'm okay. It wobbled a bit, fluffed its feathers, and flew away. After that, After having learned that the people had invisible walls designed to smack into birds, Finch kept a closer eye on them to see what other questionable things they might do. That is why Finch glanced over at them that day in spring. 
That is why she cocked her head as they walked with front door footsteps out the back. And that is why she wondered, What are they doing? The people made their way into the yard, plodding along, carrying some things Finch had never seen before. The tall person carried a stepladder. One of the short people carried a metal box. The other small person, again with those determined footsteps, carried what looked like a tiny wooden human house. How very curious. Finch watched as they came closer and closer. And why are they getting so close? Usually, Finch would take this opportunity to fly away because she had no interest in being so close to humans. But in all her time spent in this yard, she'd never seen the people do this. Her curiosity won out over her urge to flee. She stayed on the branch to see what happened next. They reached the red maple Finch was higher up, so she could look down and observe them. The people muttered to each other for a minute or two. Do you think that branch will work, huh, Dad? Then, the tall person set up the ladder near the tree trunk. The small person holding the tiny house held it up, and the tall person took it and climbed the ladder, blocking Finch's view. She hopped around on the branch, trying to get a look as the person fiddled around with the little house. It was no use, until the person stepped down the ladder. And there it was, the tiny house hanging from the tree branch. It swayed a little and then came to a stop. The people stood back and smiled, like it was the beginning of something. How long do you think it'll take? One of the little ones asked. Not sure. We'll just have to wait and see. They all turned around, and the small people broke into backyard footsteps, running around wildly, until finally, anyone want some ants on a log? Yay! Yay! They disappeared into the house. There was something so charming about their interactions. Finch tried to imagine what it would be like to have a family, a home. That snack sounds delicious, Finch thought. But she also thought, Why would they put a little tiny house in a tree? Hmm. Finch thought and thought about this. She spent the entire day wondering about it. Tiny house, tree branch, tiny house, tree branch. For some reason, Finch felt she did know something about this. She'd heard of this exact phenomenon of tiny houses in trees. It was on the tip of her beak, right there. But it would not come to her. Finch canceled her four o'clock appointment at the nearby bird bath. She could always bathe another time. This mystery of the little house was more important. She sat there, watching the house, waiting for whoever might arrive to claim it. At some point, as she was muttering to herself, Who can climb in that tiny door? Her head got heavy, her eyes closed. And she sank into her feathers for a long rest. She woke with a start the next morning. She heard some calls from birds she knew around the neighborhood. She heard some trucks in the distance. She felt the senses slowly return to her sleep-addled brain. And then, with a jolt, she sat up straight eyes as wide as they could be. It came to her. She knew, without a doubt, who that little house was for. 
She looked down at it, swaying lightly in the morning breeze. How could she be so silly? It could not have been more obvious. It's interesting how a full night of rest can bring forth crystal clear answers that were so frustratingly out of reach the day before. Finch fluffed herself and sat up with a new sense of authority. And, as if that sense of confidence radiated from her, filling the air around her with an irresistibly attractive quality, a chickadee landed just next to her at that very moment. Hi! Oh, hello, Finch said, sitting up straight, basking in her secret knowledge about the little house. She figured they'd chat a bit, circling around in conversation until landing lightly on the topic of the small human structure on the branch below. The chickadee apparently had other ideas. Look at that little house down there. I wonder if it's a house for... Time seemed to slow down as Finch processed what the chickadee was about to say. She couldn't let all that important thinking she'd just done go to waste. She had to be the one to share the secret knowledge about the little house. Fun. Gnomes, Finch blurted. There was a moment of silence, and Finch realized she had said gnomes rather loudly. She also realized the chickadee had said bugs and not gnomes. There had really been no reason for Finch to interrupt her in such an abrupt way. She felt the heat of embarrassment blossom beneath her feathers and creep upwards around her beak. Gnomes, the chickadee said at last, cocking its head to the side. I thought maybe it was for bugs. It's a house for gnomes, Finch said. Hmm, okay. Gnomes. 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 Hey, what are gnomes? Finch felt the slightest bit of satisfaction. Okay, maybe a little more than the slightest bit. At being able to share her small amount of expertise on gnomes. Gnomes are tiny little human people. They walk on two feet, wingless, featherless. They to wear understand hats. how Finch knew so much about gnomes and why she was so convinced the tiny house was put up just for them, we must go back in time. Back to when she met the Grackle. The Grackle was an imperious fellow, with the kind of grating call that could set a bird's teeth on edge, if birds had teeth. Finch met the Grackle when they both landed on the same oak tree growing at the edge of an open field of grass. A group of people appeared in the field. The people started running around, tossing something between them. A frisbee, the grackle murmured. Excuse me? Oh, did I say that out loud? The grackle asked, not looking at Finch. I was referring to the object they are throwing. It is called a frisbee. Uh, a frisbee? Frisbee. Frisbee, Finch repeated. Why are they throwing it around? Finch and the Grackle watched as one of the people leapt to catch the object. It swerved away from him, and the person hit the ground. Ah, you see, the Frisbee has magical powers. Each time they toss the Frisbee to one another, the humans gain more magic from it. Finch thought for a moment, trying to make sense of this. How do you know so much about this? The Grackle, who'd been staring at the people, fixed one beady eye on Finch. Finch flinched. 
For some reason, the grackle's stare sent a chill through her feathers, and she felt a thought bubble up. That grackle could eat me. She pushed the thought away. You should come to one of my seminars. Seminars? I'm an expert on human behavior. I give talks on different human-related topics. I'll be hosting a talk this coming Wednesday. It's about gnomes. My seminars begin promptly at 7, 12 p.m. 7, 12. Don't be late. That is how Finch found herself at a seminar learning about gnomes. Gnomes are small in stature, no more than seven sparrows' beaks tall. What? They wear pointed hats. Some have beards. Many wear boots with buckles that only their tiny opposable thumbs could manage to operate. They are a type of human person. Like humans, they have useless, featherless arms. They live in three types of dwellings. Underground in burrows. So fascinating. In the basements of human houses. I have to write this down. Or, and this is by far the most relevant to us birds, they sometimes live in tiny wooden houses. In trees. Trees? Like every other bird in the audience, Finch was captivated by the grackle. Um, Professor Grackle, why have we never seen these gnomes? Yeah, I've never seen one. I've seen one once. Actually, I think that was a naked mole rat. The grackle sighed as if it were very tiresome to have to explain such simple matters. (sighs) They hide. Any of you? Could eat a gnome. Oh my. They are small and tasty. They taste like lemon cookies. The grackle's eyes gleamed as they roved the audience. They dare not be seen by birds, and they are very good at shielding themselves from you. If you wish to see them, you must be very patient. And you must wait for many hours. Finch was enthralled. She sat through the rest of the presentation. Make sure to join me for my next talk on the subject of the smell of human feet, entitled, Why Humans Wear Footwear. Then she flew off in a daze, wondering when she'd get her very first glimpse at a real live gnome. Finch finished telling the chickadee everything she knew about gnomes. And so they hide from us, naturally. Have you seen them? Have you seen the gnomes go into the house? The chickadee asked, hopping on the branch with excitement. Not yet, but I'm sure they'll be here soon. Oh, I can't wait to see them. I'll wait with you for as long as it takes. So Finch and the chickadee sat on the branch together, waiting, for several hours. And then the chickadee said, I'm pretty hungry. I think I'm going to get going. The chickadee flew away. She did not come back. Finch was alone. She decided to keep waiting. It began to frustrate her, almost anger her that this beautiful little house was sitting there empty. There it was, just ripe for the taking for any gnome that might come along. She felt kind of jealous, imagining the gnomes settling in with their little boots with the tiny buckles. She realized her anger was likely from hunger. She scanned the ground and saw a seed. She flew down, snatched it up, and returned to the branch. The little house was quiet. As she waited for the gnomes to come, Finch tried to imagine how they would enter the house. It only had one entrance, a small, perfectly round hole in the front. 
She imagined the gnomes might have to climb all the way up the tree, out onto the branch, down onto its roof, slip down the front, and swing their little feet into the hole. Didn't seem safe. In fact, it seemed all wrong. Gnomes couldn't fly. Like humans, they have useless, featherless arms. Why would their home be hanging in a tree? But the grackle had said so. And the grackle seemed to know what he was talking about. Finch was turning this over in her mind when out of the corner of her eye she saw something move in the people's house. The two small people and the cat were behind the glass. The two small people were gazing outside at the little house in the tree. They were watching, Finch realized. They were waiting, too. Days went by. No gnomes came to the little house. It sat there, empty. Finch flew away and returned a few times to get food. Each time she came back from being away, she flew around the house to peek inside of it. Each time, the house was empty. And each time she returned to her branch, she saw the people inside the big house across the yard, looking out at the little house with renewed interest. One of them picked up a pair of binoculars and almost seemed to be using them to look at her, which didn't make any sense. I'm not a gnome. The next day, she was hungry again, and she went off to find some food. When she returned to the branch, the people's ladder was beneath the little house. They must have been here. Finch flew in her usual circle. No gnomes, but... Wait, what was that? Finch flew around again. She couldn't quite make out what was in there. Her curiosity got the best of her. She flew down, landed on the edge of the round opening, and hopped inside. It gave her a chill to be in the house. She felt like an intruder, even though she knew no one lived there. Finch looked around. Aha! The people had been there, after all. And they'd left twigs and yarn and pine needles. They must be trying to attract gnomes. Gnomes must build nests with twigs like we do. Finch thought back to the grackle's presentation. If you ever find a gnome's lost pocket watch, leave it near the foot of a tree, and you might get to see the gnome return to fetch it. But she couldn't remember him mentioning anything about gnome nests. Finch peeked out through the hole at the big house. She saw the people there, with their binoculars, staring at her. (gasps) Finch hopped out of the house and fluttered back onto her branch. She inched closer to the tree's trunk, trying to hide. Twilight darkened into night. The lights in the big house went out. The neighborhood sounds quieted. Everything was calm. But Finch felt a change in the air. A storm was on its way. I should leave now, Finch thought. But her tiny feet stayed, gripped to the branch. Something was keeping her there, against her better judgment. Sometime later, dense clouds crowded over the moon. The darkness was absolute. A gust of wind swept through the trees. Finch shivered. She saw a flash in the sky and heard a rumble of thunder. Finch chided herself. She should have taken flight as soon as she'd felt the storm coming. She could have found somewhere dry to hide until it passed. Now it was too late. 
Her mind went to the twigs and the yarn and the pine needles inside the gnome house. She glanced down. The roof on the house looked like a proper roof. Like a roof that might keep out the rain. Before thinking it through, Finch took off from the branch. She flew in a circle and landed on the edge of the round opening of the tiny house. Suddenly, it was as if a seam in the sky broke open. Rain came pouring out. Finch ducked inside the house just before it could touch her feathers. The storm continued throughout the night. Finch curled up in the twigs and the yarn. It was the first time she'd regarded the house as something other than for gnomes. Just then, it was all hers. She fell asleep, dry and warm, listening to the sound of the rain. The storm went on for days. Icy rain splashed against the roof of the little house. The wind pushed it back and forth on the branch. Finch was safe inside. She decided to stay a little bit longer. If the gnomes are anything like regular-sized people... They won't be traveling in this type of weather. That night, Finch had a dream, unlike any she'd ever had before. She dreamed she was living in the little house with another bird. She was sitting in their nest, made of twigs and yarn and pine needles, and all of a sudden... She felt something beneath her. There were three little eggs getting ready to hatch. Finch woke with a start. It took her a moment to digest her dream and to understand that it wasn't a nightmare. Sunlight streamed in her window. She hopped to the opening of the tiny house and perched on its edge. The storm was gone. It was hard to believe it had ever happened at all. The air was warm. The change in the weather, from icy rain to sun-drenched warmth, was jarring. But somehow it felt right to Finch. In the same span of time, she'd gone through her own change. She'd found a... well... She'd found a home. The word fell out of her beak, unbidden. The word kept coming to her, and Finch tried to shake it off like so many raindrops on her feathers after a sun shower. She couldn't seem to shake it off. This is my home, she whispered from the perch on the house. She looked out at the big house across the yard and stood up a little straighter when she saw the small people with their binoculars again watching her and smiling. They were smiling. She wasn't a gnome, but they were happy. And the cat almost looked like it was smiling too, even though Finch wasn't sure cats smiled. They only frowned. But still, it was kind of a happy frown, if that was possible. And what else was possible? Was it possible these humans accepted her as a temporary replacement for gnomes? Was it possible they would allow her to live here as long as it was available? Finch thought of the dream she'd had, of the eggs about to hatch. It gave her a warm feeling. Finch decided to live in the house, to look after it, and to make it her own for as long as it could be hers. She stared out at the world around her. 
She stared out at the grassy yard and the house beyond that with the big picture window. It was spring. Everything was possible. She watched as a small bird sped through the air, singing as it went. La la lee la la, boop boop, la la lee la la, boop boop, until la, it smacked la, la. into the glass. Boop, boop. Finch held her breath. I'm okay. The bird hopped up and flew away. Finch sighed woo, and went back into her house. Back into her home. I will stay, she thought to herself. I will stay until the gnomes come. Okay, so a quick update on the bird that, you know, the one glaring at me. Um, it is still there. But I realized it's not looking at me. It's looking at the studio spiders. It makes so much more sense. In fact, I mean, I knew all along that it didn't want to eat me. I knew there was no way I was in danger from this bird. I'm, I'm like at least a foot taller than that bird. So I wasn't really afraid or anything. It's kind of like when you're out and um, somebody waves and you think they're waving at you. So you wave back and um, it turns out they're they're waving at someone behind you. So it was kind of like that. I mean, not that I've ever done that because I totally haven't that frequently. So anyway, let's move on. At some point in your life, You may feel like Finch. You'll be precisely where you are supposed to be, where you are allowed to be. But you might still feel as though you are an imposter. I've felt that way. A lot of people do. Unfortunately, there may never come a time when a gnome, or anyone else, reassures you once and for all that you're in the right place. It can take time to feel at home, even when you truly are. I think it's part of growing up. Little Stories for Tiny People is written, performed, and produced by me, Rhea Pector. Peter Kay, my in-house tech director, puts my stories on the internet for all of you to enjoy. Big thanks to Bowie for the super important reminder message at the beginning. And thank you to Zeta, Noah, Sophia, Vaishnavi, Harper, Kina, Juno, Leo, Zach, Ruby, Orlin, and Pippa for the sound effects used in today's story. If you loved this story, please share it with all grackles with questionable expertise, any gnomes living in your basement, and your friends who just might need a good story. And thank you, as always, for listening in. (laughs) 